Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this special call with Tony Khan to discuss the upcoming AEW Fighter Fest shows and, of course, the historic All in London this Sunday at Wembley Stadium. So just a few quick housekeeping items in the interest of time and giving opportunity, opportunity to as many people as we can. Let's try to keep your questions one part, one, one part questions, not two part questions. Let's try to keep the questions focused on the upcoming shows this week as well. And of course, as Robin mentioned, make sure your phone is unmuted now. So Tony's got a busy day. He's had a busy, he's gonna have a busy week. Uh, let's go, Tony. Are you ready? And we're gonna open it up for you for some opening thoughts and we've got you to the top of the hour. Tony? Sounds great. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks everybody for being here. This is the most exciting week in the history of the company. Certainly it's gonna be the biggest event we've ever had and it feels like the biggest month ever for our business. Uh, and it starts tomorrow on Wednesday Night Dynamite Fighter Fest, and it's going to be a very busy week. Uh, I'll try to answer as many questions as I can, and I really just appreciate all of you being here. Thanks for doing this. And with that, Jim, please take it away. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to start with Phil Strum from the USA Network's Under the Ring, and then Jim Barcelone from the Miami Herald is on deck. Phil, you're up. Hey, Phil. Hey, Tony. Congratulations on uh, Wembley Stadium and All In. What's happening in wrestling right now is just its just great to see in an AEW for sure. Um, I'm interested in learning if you felt Young Bucks versus FTR was ever in jeopardy and if there was any discipline of Cash Wheeler following his arrest and also just your thoughts on, on that match. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'll start with my thoughts on the match. I think it's two of the greatest tag teams of all time. I have so much respect for all four men individually and each of the two teams collectively. I think they're both amazing tag teams. I think all four men are great wrestlers, and they have had great matches. Uh, when FTR arrived in AEW, it was all about the build towards FTR versus Young Bucks, and that first match was incredible at Full Gear 2020. and for a long time, we wanted to see a rematch. We finally saw it in Boston. It was an incredible match on Wednesday Night Dynamite in April of last year. Uh, and the rubber match is something I know I've personally wanted to see for w well over a year now. And I know a lot of fans in pro wrestling wanted to see it. And I thought the perfect place for the rubber match to settle one of these great rivalries in the history of tag team wrestling would be AEW all in and as for uh, things that have happened outside of the ring i can't comment on the specifics at this time because i still don't know uh everything still learning facts but based on uh the information we have uh you know at this time we're still uh keeping an eye on that situation and at this time i think it's a very inconclusive situation uh it differs from other times where we've uh come in and weighed in on a situation or acted on a situation based on the evidence because in this case uh and everything we're looking at i don't think we have those facts right now so uh at this point i think it's rather inconclusive but i do uh very much look forward to the match and uh we'll keep an eye out throughout this week and as long as it's a pending situation at what's what's happening. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Phil. As promised, next up is Jim Barcelone from Miami Herald. Steve Fall from Ten Count will will follow Jim. Jim, you're up. Thank you all so much. And again, congrats on this all in and the ticket sales and attendance. That's amazing, wonderful, and great for everybody. I'm curious to navigate a little bit to TV. Tony, I know you're an analytics guy. And I'm curious. I'm not all into the analytic part of it, so you might be able to get a better, you will be able to get a better aspect. When it's something like college football season coming up and you have the shows like Rampage and Collision Friday, Saturday, do you look at the numbers differently during that or you don't really take that into account, the different seasons of different events that are on? It's a great question. I definitely think we see pro wrestling affected by the competition at times and certainly the toughest competition in all of television is football i'm biased towards football since my family owns one of the 
32 National Football League teams, but uh, it, football is the strongest product on television by far in America, and it's the strongest product in the world. And it'll definitely have an effect on people competing with it. Uh, in our case, I believe we can do very well and hold in very strong against that competition. I also believe it'll bring more eyeballs to television on Saturdays, and there's going to be more people watching TV on Saturdays, and we can take advantage of that. But it certainly does create a more competitive landscape whenever there's football on, whether it's pro football in particular or college football. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. Um, Steve Fall from 10 Count is next. And then we're going to follow Steve with a write-in question from Alistair McGeorge from Metro.co.uk. Steve? Hey, thanks. Tony, very pumped for the show this weekend, but how difficult is it for you to put together an all-in card versus an all-out card? Like, who decides on who's going to end up on what card? Because, obviously, everybody wants to be at Wembley. So, is it a difficult decision on where these matches land? Yeah, it's a very difficult decision. I have to make that decision. Very unpleasant, and people uh, uh, absolutely do. You're completely right. Want to do whatever they can do to be on Wembley, but also there's a great show coming up the following week in another market that's hugely important to AEW, and that's Chicago, the United Center. And there'll be a lot of focus on that show. Certainly, uh, you know, as we come out all in, there'll be a lot of focus on all out. And certainly with a big spotlight on all in, it'll provide a great opportunity to promote all out. Also, the live event weekend is really important. We've got a massive ticket gross right now, obviously a massive ticket gross at Wembley Stadium, which is historic, but also one of our best gates at the United Center. We've got a great crowd coming in for all out on pay-per-view. And that is a great weekend for us to run the event in Chicago. And on the live gate alone, that's going to be a massively profitable event. So a lot of it is about the real estate that we've carved out for ourselves. And now we found something really special to do all in during the bank holiday weekend on August 27th, this Sunday in London, and then come back for Labor Day weekend in Chicago and have another very profitable live event. So I think there'll be people clamoring to be on All Out as well, but certainly the big priority right now and everybody's focus is All In, and it's with good reason because it's going to be a massive event absolutely this Sunday. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Um, I've got a write-in question here from Alistair McGeorge, uh, which I'll give you in a minute, Tony, and then John Pollock from Post Wrestling will follow. Alistair McGeorge has a pretty simple question, Tony. What kind of a ticket update can you give us for the Wembley show this Sunday? Well, as of now, we have approximately 80,000 tickets distributed and a gate of close to $10 million. And it is historic. It is by far the biggest gate in AEW's history, and this will be the biggest crowd and the biggest gate in the history of pro wrestling in Europe. And uh, that covers a lot of ground. It's going to be one of the biggest shows in the history of the world, and we'll see... Uh, how the final uh, run up, what, what what we generate, but I think it's safe to say that uh, there's going to be eighty thousand people there this weekend, and there's going to be uh, a historic uh, revenues for AEW, but also uh, should be a historic night for pro wrestling in England and a historic day for all of you back in America. I can't stress enough; it's going to be different than anything we've done uh, for the viewing habits of our pay per view audience to have uh, AEW on in this particular window when, you know, normally this would be when NFL is going to be starting on a Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern, noon Central, and, of course, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, very familiar NFL kickoff time to a lot of people. So uh, very much looking forward to that. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. Okay, we're going to move along. Uh, again, just a reminder, uh, one question per, per person. We're doing well here. John Pollock from Post Wrestling is next, followed by Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy. John. Hi, Tony. I just wanted to go back and ask you 
when you learned of the situation with Cash Wheeler, was it last week as everyone else did, or were you aware of this uh, back at the end of July when the incident allegedly occurred? I, because of the, uh, you know, the, the nature of it, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I, it's not like I've known for a long time what was going on here, but on the other hand, uh, I have uh, tried to uh, gather all the facts and information, and I still think, uh, you know, we don't have all the facts here. And, uh, you know, I don't want to comment too much on the situation, but uh, we're still gathering information, and uh, that's what I've been trying to do for the several days. Thanks, John. All right, thanks, thanks, John. Amy Nemedy from Russell Joy, you are next, followed by Brandon Thurston from Russellnomics. Amy. Hi, Tony. Uh, congratulations on this historic event with All In. I want to sort of circle back to the first All In. I've noticed that MJF was in the very first match of the first All In against Matt Cross, and now he he will be kicking off the show again with Adam Cole fighting Aussie Open for the ROH tag titles. Then he will be main eventing this show as the world champion against Adam Cole fighting for, of course, the AW World Championship. I wanted to know, what was your thought process in booking this card? How much did you consider the first all-in and how many tie-ins you could make on this historic show? Thank you for your time. That's a great question. Well, you've opened me up for several things there, Amy. I appreciate it. Uh, well, I definitely was cognizant that MJF had opened the original All In, and he also was in the first match we ever had at the original Double or Nothing, the Casino Battle Royale uh, that he was featured in and involved with Hangman Page. And there was, uh, of course, MJF on the original All In, we also, uh, as we approached this card, absolutely took that into consideration. But really, I felt like MJF Adam Cole is one of the best stories we've ever told, maybe the best story we've ever told on television. And people are very, very excited about it. People want to know uh, what's coming next with Adam Cole and MJF. And absolutely, uh, that has been... Our focus is a main event, and I was cognizant of MJF's history with All In, and and even before there was an AEW, his involvement with that show. Uh, there are definitely some callbacks, you know, to the original All In. I've I've tried to utilize the footage and video packages and referenced it when I first uh, announced the event would be coming to Wembley Stadium. And in addition to using some of those video and referencing the history of the original All In, we've been using the Is All In graphics when we make an announcement that somebody is going to be participating on the card or if it's multiple people that they are All In. And I think people have enjoyed seeing that retro feel. Uh, I have taken some amusement as people have uh, wondered why the elite would be in a trios match on all in when the main event of the original all in was a trios match <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, featured great wrestlers. And, and we have another elite trios match with Kota Ibushi in it and, and top members of the elite faction in a trios match. And, uh, I thought that was kind of fun because that was also something from the original all in, uh, absolutely very excited about the card. And there's some, great tie-in to the original show. So many people who participated on the first event are going to be a part of this event too. And uh, I was there five years ago and it was a very influential event in pro wrestling. And when I purchased Ring of Honor, one of the things I was very excited about was to own that video in our library now as well. And I'm sure that this event, this coming Sunday, uh, will not only live up to the expectations of the original all in but take that name take everything that was built that day and take it to the next level thank you thank amy you. brandon thurston from russellnomics you are next chris mueller from bleacher report you are on deck brandon hi tony thanks for your time today um hey brandon 
look, looks like All In is going to be a, among the highest attendances ever, uh, maybe both in, in terms of paid attendance and total attendance. And as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of controversy around the two shows, at least that, that you're in the neighborhood of now, WrestleMania 3 and WrestleMania 32. I was, I was wondering if you would be willing after the, sh the show is done and all, all the tickets are sold, if it does set the record, would you be willing to make the ticket audit or other records available to the media just to, to minimize the controversy that it, it feels like is going to be inevitable after the show? I am not sure. I've never been in that position before. Uh, so uh, what would WWE you – know, I'm sorry to follow up my question with a question. Brandon, what would WWE do in my position? They they would put out a press re press release and uh, with with a number that may include uh, ushers and ticket takers and personnel and things like that. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet, but I've never. But it's fun being in this position for the first time ever. So I'm just wondering. Uh, well, I'll uh, I'll have to uh, take it all into account, and uh, we'll definitely be doing a very thorough audit of the building, and uh, I will uh, get you guys as best as I can an accurate number as I always do, and. Um, I've never been in that particular position before to, to do that math. So uh, I look forward to uh, uh, announcing an accurate number. And uh, I'm not sure how long it'll take us to come up with it, but I'm, but I'm very excited uh, to have a good number for you guys on Sunday. And hopefully it'll be a historic number that we can all get excited about. But honestly, whether, you know, uh, wherever it falls, I think it's going to fall certainly as one of the most successful events ever. And, uh, you know, um, it's not about really nickel and diming. I think it's about packing the stadium, which we have done, and uh, it's a very, very important milestone for us. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pumped up for it wherever it falls. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Chris Mueller from Bleacher Report, you are next. Stephanie Chase from Digital Spy follows Chris. Chris? Hey, hey Tony. Hey, so with Wembley being such a, a big success already before it even happened, it has to kind of pique your interest in doing international pay-per-views more often. So I'm kind of curious if you had other countries on a list maybe that you're already kind of scouting for future events. Well, it's a great question. We have AEW on in 150 countries around the world now. So there's definitely more opportunities for international events and uh, this will be a great learning experience for us. You know, we did Forbidden Door in Toronto, which is obviously a lot closer to America. Uh, so the logistics were complicated, but they weren't nearly as complicated as what's happening right now, where you've got a good percentage of the AEW production team is not going to be at TV this week. They're going to be uh, in Georgia making it happen. And I'm sorry, you know, excuse me. They're not going to be in Georgia this week. They're going to be in London making it happen. And uh, while we're putting the TV together in Georgia, we're going to have a good percentage of our team in London assembling the set and loading in to Wembley. Uh, we'll learn a lot from this, and I expect more international events in the future. As, as far as where we would go, it's a great question. I'm not sure yet, um, but certainly uh, it's, it's been a very good year for us with international touring as our biggest events have actually been these international events with uh, all in and now Forbidden Door, which is going to be another one of our top gates we've ever had. So it's definitely something we want to keep doing. And uh, for a young company like ourselves that launched in America, uh, but launched with a great TV partner overseas in ITV in the UK in particular, it, this is something I've wanted to do for a long time. And I think the strength of the TV partnership in England that we've implemented from the very beginning before we ever launched helped put us in this position uh, because of the power of ITV in the UK. Thanks, man. Thanks, Chris. Stephanie Chase from Digital Spy is next. Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone will follow Stephanie. Hey, Tony. How are you? I'm well, Stephanie. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask because the, the Elite recently resigned with Omega and the Young Bucks staying on as EVPs as well. Um, how would you define their roles as EVPs now, especially if you compare it to wrestlers such as Chris Jericho and CM Punk, who also appear to do a lot backstage but don't hold any title? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I think it 
is uh, a variety of responsibilities that different people backstage carry. Certainly, from the very beginning of AEW, uh, Kenny Omega, Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson have been in, very involved in uh, coming up with ideas and uh, helping build some of the major events, including the original All In, which was actually before AEW even launched and is brilliant creation uh, from the Young Bucks. And I think that uh, with in particular, Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, they have a great connection to the fabric of the company and the history of the company. And as we've gone on, I've, I've added people to the team, uh, people that work backstage, people that are uh, also executives. Some some of them are wrestlers, but for the most part, you know, there's not a lot of people that carry the executive title and uh, are featured on the wrestling show. So... Uh, regularly and so importantly as Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. So I do think um, as we approach the first ever AEW All-In, it's a great time to look back at all the great things that Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks have done here in AEW. And, of course, uh, they're three of the four uh, original executive vice presidents along with Cody Rhodes. And the four of them put together an event with the original All-In that has stood the test of time and captured the imaginations of fans around the world. And based on the success of that original event, I thought that bringing the first ever AEW all in had the potential to be our biggest event ever. And it has been. So it's a, it's a huge blessing for the company and in large part, thanks to the elite Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks for creating all in. So uh, they're still a, a huge part of the company and, very excited to have them participating in All In five years later. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thanks, Stephanie. Bill Pritchard from Russell's Own You are next. And then I've got a write-in question, Tony, from Mike Johnson at PW Insider. For now, it's Bill. Great. Good afternoon, Tony. How are you? Um, good afternoon, Bill. I'm very well. How are you, sir? Good. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the actual match card that's been announced, if you could comment on this being the final card or if anything else could be added. I know, you know, specifically Paul White's kind of teased something with Captain Insano and there's some other matches that maybe fans expected to be announced that aren't yet. Could you comment on how final what I think it's nine matches are? I, th this is, there will be adjustments to the card. Some of them have been planned from the beginning. Some of them are things that we're dealing with on the fly. I would love it if the first thing I wrote down months ago for every pay-per-view card was what actually came to life. It is rarely the case that you put ideas down on paper and then uh, months and months go by and there's no major changes to that set of ideas. I wish that everything in pro wrestling happened in a vacuum and that all of our best ideas, as they played out on paper, didn't get changed up. Uh, this has been very challenging, uh, but honestly, I've been through a lot of challenging stuff, and I understand when somebody gets injured, on one hand, you, could, you can blame the company for that. I mean, they're fluke things. So if two wrestlers go out and have a match and somebody gets injured in the match doing a wrestling move, look, they, like, the company, sure, like, we put them in the wrestling match. There, if there's an injury, it is our fault. But on the other hand, any time we do a show, there's going to be a bunch of wrestling matches, and you have to accept the possibility there may be injuries and things that are going to change the card. There's been a lot of that with this show. What I'm very, 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 very grateful for is that none of it has involved MJF and Adam Cole, which could have happened. Certainly last year, for example, I lost Adam Cole twice in one summer. Not only did I lose Adam Cole twice in one summer, within the span of four days, due to injuries, I lost CM Punk, Brian Danielson, and Adam Cole, all for extended periods of time, within two shows that happened four days apart. And that would be, or I guess three days apart. So within three days, I lost uh, Punk, Brian, and Cole, uh, last summer, 22, between Double or Nothing and Dynamite 
episode 139 at the forum. And uh, then, um, you know, that summer was very challenging. It was already challenging with Kenny Omega being out. MJF had stepped away. Uh, it was a challenging summer, but I think we worked through it and came out of it in a good position. There has not been that many injuries uh, all at once. But then uh, slowly, kind of one at a time, things have added up, and they changed the card a lot. So Brian Danielson was somebody I – wanted to have prominently involved in this card as well. Certainly this MJF Adam Cole story has been something that has been in the works. The idea of them as a tag team and uh, it's just clicked so beautifully and there are ideas you have on paper that click and you, you know, I love working with MJF and Adam Cole and their stuff is going so well. I'm so happy. And that has been, a real blessing for the company and I think a real blessing for this pay-per-view. And I will, as I say this, I am now going to knock on wood uh, 10 times that, uh, that it stays this way. Now, uh, as of right now, uh, I have, I have no reason to believe as of now that there, there will be a status change to the tag team title match. Obviously we'll keep an eye on that situation. I'm not saying I'm taking it lightly, but as of what I've seen right now, I haven't seen enough uh, to make, the change there and I'm not expecting to but I will keep an eye on it and I'm taking this that seriously but it is also one of the most important matches in the history of the company and I'm very excited about it and as it stands right now I'm, I think it's going to be one of the greatest tag team matches we've had and it's certainly one of the greatest nights we've had so I believe it's very fitting that we have this huge world championship match MJF versus Adam Cole that's been building uh, here in AEW literally for months and this huge World Tag Team Championship that we've been wanting to see for years with Young Bucks uh, versus FTR, and uh, very excited about both those world title matches. Then there's been a lot of other changes throughout the card. Um, Brian Danielson, who is such an important part of AEW, I had figured in to be in one of the main matches on this show, and losing Brian Danielson to any wrestling company at any point in history is going to be just very challenging, as it was when we lost him in the past. It's to a completely different injury and really a fluke thing that happened in Forbidden Door that nobody could have predicted, and uh, it's nobody's fault. And then uh, we lost two of our top British stars, Jamie Hayter and Pac, who I wanted to both be very prominently involved in this show I think it's it's fair to say that they are the top uh, uh, homegrown, in Jamie Hayter's case, female British star and and probably the top signature male British star of the company in PAC, although I wouldn't say it's completely fair to call PAC homegrown since he had a lot of experience wrestling on television worldwide before he arrived here. Uh, but to lose Brian Danielson, PAC, and Jamie Hayter, that changed a lot of plans. But we knew that they were all probably going to be out uh, in recent weeks and had time to plan for that. Now I'm going to be honest with you about more stuff. I expect more changes. They were not changes I wanted to make or planned to make. I'm not talking about the aforementioned matches, not the world championship match or even the world tag team title match or any of these other matches that I just brought up. There will probably be some other changes to the card necessitated by things happening in the real world. Uh, stuff, in some cases, stuff that's nobody's fault. Uh, but stuff that is not related to the world of professional wrestling. And I am going to try to work through this week to make it as strong as possible without with actually making the card hopefully better uh, than it has been. But, yeah, th there will be changes to the card. I'm planning to add something, and I might have to make some changes within the body of the card as it stands right now. But they're not substantive changes that will change the quality of the show, and I'm very glad that, uh, the big matches are in such a good position right now. And also, to be honest, I think you're, you're going to have to stay tuned. And then after you see some changes, I, you know, whether it's in a scrum after the pay-per-view or whatever, I can talk to you more about when and why I decided to do those. But it's not like they were things that even a week or two I knew about or was expecting uh, to have to change. And uh, that's part of pro wrestling. You know, I've, I've seen some some people talking about the way they've 
the way the show's been built. And I think a lot of people would agree that MJF and Adam Cole, the main event from the very beginning, has had a lot of attention by design. And uh, that has been a bedrock program. And I think with a big wrestling pay-per-view, you want to spend a lot of time building up that main event and have a lot of storytelling. In the case of MJF and Adam Cole, there is a lot of storytelling. And we put up a while back, leading into the MJF and Adam Cole versus FTR tag team match, uh, we uh, had a video we put together that was a, a kind of a best of or a super cut of all the moments uh, since MJF and Adam Cole first uh, started interacting ahead of their first match, which was a 30-minute draw. And, and then the things that have happened in the week since as they became an unlikely tag team and very successful and became friends. And as that friendship grew, we followed it closely. It's been really interesting stuff. And we made a super cut of that that we posted before their tag team title shot against FTR. And then we recently updated it with everything that's happened, including that match against FTR for the tag team championships, which is a great match on July 29th in Hartford on Collision. And, and then everything that's happened since then, since July 29th with Adam Cole and MJF leading into this match, it's a fascinating story. And actually the video we posted, I believe is almost two hours long. And so we've got nearly two hours of story, uh, just really featuring the best of clips. And there's a lot of information in there. So for anybody who wants to go back and see the story, there's a lot of storytelling and there really is a lot there. I also put up a video looking back at the history of FTR and Young Bucks because I'm so excited about the match. I'm so excited about the tag team championship uh, being at stake and, and these two teams and these four men in this position, Matt, Nick, Dax, and Cash, they've come so far in their careers. And I've followed uh, both teams for a long time before there was an AEW. I'm a huge fan of both teams. It was a dream come true to have that match in Daly's place for the first time ever. I actually sat in Gorilla producing that match and I had Shaq sitting next to me. I watched it with one of my heroes and he was blown away by the quality of the match and the quality of that show. And that was one of my greatest nights as a wrestling producer, Full Gear 2020 in Jacksonville. And the, the energy of the crowd, even though it was a physically distanced crowd and we were only putting 25% capacity in because of COVID restrictions. The people that showed up that night made that a great show, including the fans who came and, of course, the wrestlers who made it a great night of wrestling. And uh, to have FTR versus Young Bucks here, it's a really big deal. And if you look back at uh, some of their history over the years and how far this goes back, it really is a throwback uh, to the old days of Daly's Place. And uh, I think. It's going to be a great match. Then, uh, in addition to those history videos we posted with FTR and the Young Bucks and with Adam Cole and MJF, we posted a, a look at the history with Swerve and Darby Allen. I don't know if they posted it yet. I'm not sure if they have. I actually asked them because I asked for these videos myself, and I had them made to show people some of the storytelling we've been doing. And, you know, so people, in case they missed a week here or there or missed a step in the story, they can catch it. I actually asked them to go back a little further and, and do an extended cut of the Darby and Swerve because their story really even goes back to last year when Swerve first came into AEW. He wrestled Darby in an Owen Hart qualifier. We established their friendship with each other. Uh, they were involved in the Casino Battle Royale, and it was the first time we saw Swerve uh, with a little bit of questionable character, as albeit it's every man for himself, but he uh, threw out his good friend Darby Allen from behind. Then in the first ever Royal Rampage, he tried to do it again. And uh, Darby caught on, and Darby swerved the swerver this time. And uh, so it showed, I think, they, they have an interesting friendship and a dynamic that goes pretty far back here in AEW. And it picked back up recently this year in the Blind Eliminator Tag Team Tournament uh, when Orange Cassidy and Darby Allen advanced over Swerve and his former friend, former partner Keith, and uh, it was a great match, and it reignited things between Darby and Swerve in a major way. And then 
uh, Swerve ended up costing Darby and Orange their match in that tournament, and it's led to a lot of interesting stuff in recent weeks between Darby and Swerve. And I really feel like those two are the focus, Darby and Swerve. But we've added a lot of interesting characters and built an interesting story along the way involving the Mogul Embassy, Nick Wayne, and Sting. And uh, But Darby and Swerve have a lot of history, and I want people to see that, uh, you know, that it's really largely about those two. And uh, there's going to be a lot of great stuff on this card. I will be adding stuff, as I said. But I will also be changing things. They were not things I was expecting to change, but that is the nature of wrestling. But I am really excited about what we built here, and I think the stories we've been telling we will still be able to tell. I'm very optimistic. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> um, got this write-in question here from Mike Johnson from PW Insider. And after that, we're going to go to Dominic D'Angelo from Inside the Ropes. Tony, um, uh, Mike asks, what has your father's reaction been to all in London ticket sales and all this success thus far? It's been a long way, or it, it, it is a long way, from him taking you to the ECW arena in Philly. Yeah. It is. It is a long way. Um, well, um, I know my dad's very proud of the success of AEW, and in particular, All In. This is all happening because of him. He is the reason that I've been in a position to launch AEW in the first place, and he's the reason I started going to Wembley Stadium and built these relationships, and he's the reason I built the relationships in sports that allowed me to get my foot in the door to make AEW a reality five years ago. And he is the most savvy businessman I know. And he is very aware of the huge success that is AEW All In at Wembley Stadium. So I was actually with him last night talking about it. And he's very, very excited about the event and uh, everything it represents. It's definitely a long way from him taking me to see wrestling events as a young kid. And he was never a wrestling fan. It wasn't like he wanted to be there. But I think that speaks to what a good dad he was because uh, he supported me being a wrestling fan, even though he didn't really like wrestling or didn't care particularly about it, it wasn't for him. He was doing it. He was doing it for me, which I have always really appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Dominic D'Angelo from Inside the Ropes, you are next. And we're going to follow Dominic with Robert Butler from the BBC. Dominic. Hey, hey Tony, how are you doing today? Doing good, Tom. Uh, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on all, all in coming up here. And I wanted to commend you too for the Maui Food Bank uh, doing that all last uh, week for Dynamite, Rampage, and uh, Collision. Uh, question I had was regarding Sting. Uh, obviously, he had a little bit of a persona change just to tweak uh, this past uh, Dynamite. But um, a lot of speculation early on was that he was going to be, this might have been his final match coming up here. But um, it looks like he'll be around for maybe a little bit longer. I was curious if you had any further conversation with Sting about uh, a contract situation, maybe extending him or him lingering around a little bit longer for you. I have. Sting is very well aware. I would like him to stay as long as he feels physically up to wrestling. And I think he really enjoys doing it. He's having a lot of fun. Sometimes you hit on things in life you think are going to be good and they turn out to be great. And for me, a good example of that is Sting and Darby together. Not just on screen, but off screen too. I am very, very fortunate that Sting listened to my suggestion when he first was thinking about coming back to the ring and I suggested that he watch some matches from a young man named Darby Allen and uh, check him out and get familiar with him. And, and I wanted to introduce the two of them because I thought they could uh, really hit it off. And they have, to say the least. And in the ring and out of the ring, they are an incredible pair. And I'm very excited that 
this will be one of the great moments in one of the great careers in wrestling. And we've really had some very special moments for staying in AEW, where I think we'll be able to hold his AEW run up as these were many of the really special great moments in my great career. I think Wembley Stadium will be a really important chapter. And certainly Grand Slam, Sting and Darby versus FTR at the original Grand Slam, I think was one of the great matches of Sting's career. And then he went back to New York and had another great match last year against the House of Black. And I really think that so many of the memories we've created here with Sting, I also would, would include uh, the original Forbidden Door, where Sting and Darby wrestled against the Young Bucks and the Bullet Club. What an amazing match. What a great start it was to the match, too, with Sting uh, jumping out of the shadows onto the Young Bucks. It was an amazing match. And uh, I, there's been so many great memories for Sting in AEW. I don't want it to end. And I won't be the one to pull the plug on it. So when the time comes, Sting knows he needs to be the one to say, I don't want to do this anymore because I'm going to let him go as long as he wants. And I want him to stay as long as he can. And it's so important to me that we let Sting finish his career the right way. And he's on this amazing run in AEW. He's undefeated. Through all these great matches Sting has had, he's built the best winning streak in all of AEW, which to me is befitting of one of the best wrestlers of all time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, I want to recognize we had a question earlier from uh, a write-in from Steve Herman from the BBC that uh, I believe you've already answered, Tony, but Robert Butler from the BBC has something for you here next. We're going to follow Robert with John Alba from Fight. Robert? Yeah, thanks very much. I'm sure you're aware of how excited everyone is over here in the UK for this show, Tony. Everyone's so pumped for it. I just wanted to talk about Soraya and the, the impact she's had on the company and also the fact that she's got this, this incredible family from just up the road from Wembley Stadium in Norwich. And I know they're going to be there. And, and her brother, Zach, has already been part of AEW Television. And I know he's doing all he can to, to get that big break in America. So, so talk to us about Soraya and, and her and her family's impact on, on the wrestling world. Absolutely. Soraya is a great wrestler. Soraya is a great part of AEW. She's been here for nearly one year now. And certainly today, as it stands, this is uh, the biggest moment of her AEW run. And I think it's a big opportunity in her career, one of the biggest. And Soraya's had a great wrestling career. It's been documented, obviously, on film and uh, in print. And it is the stuff of legend. She's part of a, a, a tremendous wrestling family. We're excited to have them as part of the event. Uh, just up the road, maybe uh, a little, uh, I think Carroll Road is quite a drive from Wembley Stadium, as I recall. But uh, nevertheless, it is, uh, it, it is a drive. It's drivable. And uh, I love uh, Wembley Stadium very much, but the, the place Soraya's from is, is lovely as well. I think Norwich is great. Uh, I've, I've visited Carroll Road. I've gone uh, with Fulham there and it really enjoyed it and enjoyed meeting Delia Smith and Stephen Fry and all the people there. And uh, they, they have a very nice group of people at the football club as well. It's a great town. Uh, so... Uh, Soraya is uh, an amazing, amazing story. She's an amazing person, and she's got a great group around her. I have, I think very highly of Soraya and Ruby Soho and Tony Storm, who is also part of this big four-way match for the Women's World Championship that Tony Storm has held twice. And uh, it's a very interesting dynamic what's happening with Soraya and Tony now. And... Uh, to have the two of them in there, along with two former world champions in Dr. Brett Baker, DMD, and Hikaru Shida, who are arguably the two most successful women's wrestlers ever in AEW. It's a great group. It should be a, a great match, and uh, certainly uh, there'll be a lot of Soraya's friends and family and fans in the stands 
on Sunday at Wembley Stadium. Thanks, man. Thank you, Robert. John Alba from Fight, you are next. John will be followed by Michael Shalik from SE Scoops. Hey, Tony. Thanks, Jim, for the time. Thank you, Tony, for the time as well. Uh, congratulations on the big events coming up these next couple of weeks. You have been really vocal, Tony, the past month or so about the streaming potential for AEW in the future, specifically as far as Max is concerned. And I'm sure that leveraging a show like All In into further distribution would be something you guys would have interest in. I'm curious, from your discussions with Warner Brothers Discovery, what lens do they view AEW through as a property? We've heard reports that they're going to repurpose Bleach Report for the Max platform as a tier. Do they view AEW as a sports-centric program, or does it fall in a different category? I believe we do fall in with sports. We're a very, very prominent, wide sporting event. We do tremendous ratings. This You may have seen a press release that Warner Brothers Discovery put out yesterday afternoon publicizing the success of AEW Dynamite Fight for the Fallen, which was the number one show on cable in multiple demographics. And Among Young Men was the number two show on all of television, uh, including network. And uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, very excited about the potential of AEW. In the past year, I've been very fortunate to get to spend time with Mr. Zasloff, and Mr. Zasloff is really excited about AEW. I will take it a step further. Uh, I saw Mr. Zasloff over the holidays, uh, with my father, and I walked up to him and introduced my father to him, and uh, the first thing he said to my dad is, your son is effing killing it. Uh, so I was very uh, pleased with that and proud of that, and uh, always nice when your boss uh, tells your dad that you're doing a good job, uh, and I believe it's true. I think we're doing a great job, and Warner Brothers Discovery is very pleased with the work we're doing, and uh, I'm just glad that uh, – you know, Mr. Zasloff likes what we're doing. I think that bodes really well for everybody at AEW and, and the future of the company and hopefully good for the wrestling business to have one of the most powerful people in entertainment take a notice of what we're doing, paying attention to doing it, and trying to create opportunities for us. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, we've got time for two more, and we're going to go with Michael Shalek from SC Scoops, and we're going to close with Lee Stewart from Liverpool Live Radio. Michael. Hey, Tony, uh, best of luck this weekend. Earlier this month, AEW announced that the Elite has signed new multi-year contracts. Uh, Mark Henry later stated on a radio appearance that Kenny Omega signed for four years. So please, you can correct me if that's incorrect. But my question is, did the Young Bucks and Hangman Page re-sign for the same length of time, four years? I have to go back and look at the paperwork. I think that the lengths are a little bit different, but the start dates are also a little bit different too. And, uh, you know, people had missed time due to injuries, at different uh, points in their contracts. So they were expiring at different points, too. So it's not like everybody's deals were expiring on the same day. So I don't think they all end exactly on the same day. But everybody signed a multi-year deal uh, and is going to be here for several years. And uh, I've had really good talks with all of them. I have a lot of respect for them. I'm actually going to be filming something with Kenny later today that I'm really looking forward to. And I uh, have really uh, enjoyed uh, – I've always enjoyed spending time with Kenny, but, but really uh, – Recently, I've, I've really uh, gotten to bond with them a lot and uh, enjoyed it. And the Young Bucks and Hangman Page, I have so much respect for them. We'll be seeing them very soon uh, as well. I'm literally going as soon as I get off this phone to film something with Kenny, though, since you asked about him and made me think of it. And uh, I am really excited that they're all going to stay. I don't think the dates all match up exactly, but the, the idea is the same with all four deals, that we want them all here to be uh, m multiple years in AEW, and uh, that's why we did multi-year deals with all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. 
Okay, the last one is coming as promised from Lee Stewart from Liverpool Live Radio. Lee? Lee, you need to unmute your line. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you now, yes, sir. Ah, apologies. Uh, it was touched upon oh. earlier um, that uh, obviously All In being the not only the largest selling wrestling event in the UK, but the largest in AEW history. Uh, with that, and um, with your connections with ITV uh, and other UK connections, are we can we expect to see a bit more of a regular occurrence in the UK for AEW? I will uh, save that announcement for another date, but I think it's a very good question. I, I Unfortunately, because you asked the, the question now as we're leading into this event, I, I don't think it's the best timing for me to answer it, but I do think uh, I am very excited about the event and what it represents. And uh, if you look at you know how I've done things historically when something succeeds like this, um, I think there's a there's a very good chance for that. And uh, I'm so optimistic about the future of AEW in the UK. We have a great relationship with ITV, as you mentioned. I think they are the perfect partner for AEW Pro Wrestling in England. And they have that history of carrying pro wrestling for decades. And I believe ITV is the channel that is the most closely associated with the history of pro wrestling. So it's very fitting that we have that relationship with ITV. You know, just as in uh, America, we have that relationship with TBS and TNT, which are channels that have an amazing history of carrying pro wrestling. And in Canada with TSN, that has a great history with wrestling. Well, in England, we have that with ITV, and ITV is also the most powerful commercial channel in the country. And in that partnership, it's really helped us grow the business in the UK and helped us get to the point where we could do something this exciting, where we're expecting 80,000 fans at Wembley Stadium this Sunday for All In. Okay, <clears throat> Lee, thank you. Tony, we got like about 60 seconds. Anything you want to close with? Uh, no, I really appreciate it, Jim. Thank you for moderating this, and I just want to thank everybody in the wrestling media for taking the time uh, and listening in on this call i hope i got to answer almost everybody's question and if you didn't get one in please uh keep coming i will try to get you in and also please come to the shows anybody who comes to the pay-per-view scrum i always try to make sure if you're there that you get at least one question answered and uh, i look forward to seeing a lot of you soon hopefully either in london or in chicago or another show in the future as i mentioned there will still be some uh changes to the card but the uh, substance of the card and the essence of the card will not only remain intact, but I think they will get better in the days to come as a result of necessitated things I will do. And I know we're all really looking forward to the show. I, in particular, are looking forward to MJF versus Adam Cole, FTR versus Young Bucks, and hopefully one of the best nights of pro wrestling in the history of AEW. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that uh, we've had a lot of great shows. This is going to be unlike anything we've ever done. I believe in addition to uh, a great night of pro wrestling, this will be the most memorable night overall as a company that we've ever had. And, and it may stand the test of time as the one people always point to. And it wouldn't be possible without all of you. So thank you very much, all of you uh, who attended this and everybody who covers AEW and gives us the opportunity uh, to to do something that is, to me, a dream come true. And, and this show in particular is the embodiment of that dream. Uh, nobody ever would have thought this was possible. Believe it or not, I've uh, this isn't the first show I've ever drawn up to, go, to, to play at Wembley Stadium. Uh, I've been, as a fan, I'd wrote wrestling shows for years, and one of my real dreams was always to do a Wembley show and uh, thanks all of you and 
all the great wrestlers in AEW. We're going to make it come true this Sunday. So thank you very much. All right. That's wonderful. Thanks, Tony. Well, as Tony said, we're now at the end of our time. So we're going to be distributing the, uh, the audio recording here to all the attendees shortly. So, again, on behalf of Tony and everybody at AEW, thanks for being part of today's call and especially for all you do to bring professional wrestling to fans worldwide. We're looking forward to you know, seeing you this week um, for AEW Fighter Fest in, in, uh, in Duluth and, of course, uh, in London on Sunday for AEW All in London at Wembley Stadium. So thanks again very much and have a great day.